to episode 249 of the Daily Fantasy Edge. My name is Adam Levitan. I, of course, am one of the analysts here at DraftKings. I'm the father of the most beautiful beast in the world, Jerry. And we are just six days away from the Super Bowl. For this momentous occasion, we have brought in one of the best friends of the show, perhaps the most frequent guest in the history of the show. Undoubtedly, one of the biggest winners in the history of DFS, the man who makes the water rain down upon all of Africa. It is, of course, Drew Dinkmeyer, a.k.a. the Dinkpot, a.k.a. the Dink Piece of Daily Roto. Drew, what's going on? Not much, man. I'm super excited to be talking showdown. We've had uh, we've had a lot of showdown success at Daily Roto this season, mostly from from Drewby, mostly from Colin Drew. But um, so we've joked about naming, renaming the site Daily Showdown. Um, so I'm super excited. The Super Bowl is going to be great. We've got two high scoring offenses. Th- those are the best games for for showdowns in general. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we're going to get into the Drewby thing. Uh, don't worry. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but you alluded to it how. Um, I have not played much showdown or hardly at all. And you've alluded to a game type, which is relatively new, which I think a lot of people haven't worked on a lot. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that you and the Daily Roto guys have had so much success in showdown. But for the Super Bowl, they have finally broken me. Uh, They've done it. Uh, I am playing this one game Super Bowl slate. I just can't stand on the sidelines for an NFL slate, like when I know there's going to be a ton of action and probably a ton of really good action. Like I just can't be on the sidelines for this, especially when I know that there's going to be um, such a long hiatus until we get back into August and an NFL action. So uh, let me tell you one reason that I haven't played much. I was hesitant to play showdown because I didn't see a big edge in picking players from one game. Like there's so few options to choose from is there really a strategy? Is there really an edge other than just jam in the best players? I'm curious if you think there's a real edge. And actually, I, I've kind of changed my mind on this where I kind of think there is now. But maybe I assume you do think there's a real edge. And if so, why don't you tell the people what you think the hardworking players edge is in showdown format? Yeah, I actually think this is very different than most DFS sports in terms of where the edges are. I think in showdown, the edges are not on just projections in terms of like who has the best projections and who's going to jam in the right projections and win. I think the edge in showdown is more along the lines of roster construction and specifically through mass multi-entry roster construction. I think it's a lot harder to rec- uh, to realize an edge in showdown just playing like one lineup every showdown slate. Mm-hmm. Um, there is some There is some edge to be had in like head-to-heads and different things with just emphasizing the more consistent producing positions like quarterback and running back, so on and so forth. But I think long-term the edge and showdown, you know, is a question mark. And I think your assessment of whether there is an edge and showdown is correct for long-term, but I think short-term there's an edge in terms of how you build lineups and how you think about kind of constructing your own, your overall mass multi-entry set. And I honestly, I think that's been, you know, Colin has, has really taught me a lot through this season about thinking through that. And I think that's been a lot of the reason that our subscribers have had success because we're often talking more about the overall lineup construction uh, than necessarily like one individual play or who's the right captain play or things like that. I think that's kind of the wrong way to try to create an edge in showdown games. Uh, let's tell the people the rules first because a lot of people probably don't even know the rules. So unlike normal DraftKings slate where it's a nine-man roster and there's position requirements, this is a six-man roster and everybody's a flex. You can play any positions. That includes multiple quarterbacks. That includes kickers. That includes defenses, whatever you want. Um, one thing that stood out to me about the scoring was there's no negatives on the kicker. So like kicker goes out and misses a field goal. No negative. One point, extra point, three for up to 39, four, 40, 49, five, 50 plus. I mean, to me, um, I don't know. I would have to go back and test data on it. But kickers seem to be very likely, particularly in a game like we have the Super Bowl, a really high scoring game. Um, and some bend but bro- don't break defenses. Uh, kickers seem to certainly be in play. I, I think the thing that makes the in- the format most interesting, though, and you already mentioned it, and what makes it actually cool is this captain spot. Um, not only do you get 1.5x the scoring out of your captain, but you have to pay 1.5x 
the salary. It just creates like so many more combos, I think, than there would be in a standard format. Um, like, guess we're going to talk about captain strategy in a minute here, but anything else that I'm missing with the scoring and what we should be aware of roster format and scoring and how it's different from the regular nine man roster. No, I think you covered most of it there. You've got a few different positions than you have in traditional, um, you know, main slate kind of DFS stuff. And you've also got the captain's spot, which is one and a half X points and one and a half X salary, which just allows for a lot more differentiation. So it is a really cool format. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit different and you have to be pretty thoughtful, um, specifically around that captain spot, um, mm-hmm. in GPPs. And that's, that's something I'm sure we'll dig into. All right, before we get to the captain, which I think is important, I, I want to, the first thing that came to my mind was like, how could you not play two quarterbacks? And obviously, like, if it's, if it's you know, two really dusty quarterbacks or whatever, I get it, maybe you only play one or, or you play none, whatever. But in a game like we have here with Brady and Goff or a game like we had with Breeze and Goff or Mahomes and Brady, and I know they're expensive, whatever, whatever, uh, quarterback scoring is so projectable and has such a high floor. Obviously, the ceiling isn't as high as hitting on somebody who catches 10 passes, but given how uh, projectable and high floor quarterback scoring is, uh, how is it not typically right to play two quarterbacks? So it is typically right in the sense of trying to build like the best median projection outcome lineup. Almost all of those will usually have two quarterbacks. In terms of trying to correlate your lineups to have the best upside in an individual game, sometimes it's not right. And that'll depend a little bit on the game flow. It'll depend a little bit on how you're building the lineups. But in general, the the best strategy is going to be having, you know, the two quarterbacks, um, maybe one or two kickers, because usually the kickers are a little bit underpriced for median projected outcomes. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing head to heads, if you're playing double ups, 50 50s, those types of games, uh, those types of strategies are going to be very, very relevant for mass multi entry and GPP. It's going to be different. And we'll talk through those differences. Uh, do you know, can you play, do you have to play guys from both teams or could I play six Rams if I wanted to? You, you can play five and one. Five and so one. you can play uh, one player from, from another team. And those lineups can be extremely popular in terms of getting up to the winning lineups if you're right on the current, on the correct game situation. Um, so yeah, the, those, those are other nuances where you can just load up on one team and create massive onslaughts that are a little bit more viable than on like a full main slate, you know, GPP where you're, com- you're, Uh, competing with so many other different combinations and other different games out there and just a one game like a really low scoring game where one team is dominant loading up on their side of the ball uh, can certainly pay dividends um let's talk about the captain spot because people you already mentioned people get hung up on it like the big question everybody wants to know who do i play in the captain who's the captain because it is really important you're spending perhaps if you have an expensive guy spending a huge portion of your salary on it uh, and 1.5 x points um is it typically right to just play the best value or maybe it's just the highest projected player? Or, I mean, sometimes we have guys who are in play at maybe 1K, which is very small salary on this slate. Uh, Is there a standard typical strategy for the captain spot? There isn't particularly a standard strategy. I would say often is quarterbacks or running backs because they're the most projectable. They usually carry the highest projection. The challenge is every slate is unique in terms of the depth of the player pool for an individual game. Some offenses are really spread out and you might get cheap guys that you can kind of fill in that way. And thus, you know, the best overall uh, play might be the right captain spot. Some games are really thin in terms of the concentrated offenses that you're dealing with. And as a result, those players are all priced up really heavily. So if you jam in an expensive captain, you're immediately removing you know, two or three of the other expensive guys from your potential roster build. And so in those lineups, sometimes like I think it, uh, the Rams Saints game last week, one of our top optimals had Greg Zerline as the captain. And it's not because we had Greg Zerline projected for like an incredible projection or anything like that. It was just that allowed you to get in some of the more concentrated pieces, the Alvin Kamara's, the Michael Thomas's, the Jared Goff, Robert Woods, Brandon Cooks, those types of guys, you can get more of them into your lineup. So it depends a little bit on the depth of or, or the level of concentration in each respective offense that you're dealing with. For this specific game, these are really concentrated offenses. We pretty much know where the ball's going on both sides. Uh, the Rams, you know, obviously splitting the running back position of late has created a little bit more depth there. But the three wide receivers are on the field, 90 plus percent of the snaps. Uh, for the Patriots, the ball's almost always going in the hands of Julian Edelman, James White, occasionally Gronk or Sonny Michelle. So with these really concentrated offenses, it might be a, a slate where you look to a little bit more value at the captain spot to be able to fit in more of the guys in total that you're, you're trying to get into the lineups. 
All right, uh, let, let's talk kickers. You already alluded to how um, kickers can help open up stuff. Kickers are typically a bit underpriced on this slate. Steven Goskowski is 4,800. Greg Zerline is 5,100. Um, I mean, like, I haven't, I mean, DraftKings has never had kickers. Obviously, I don't have a lot of experience <laughs> rostering kickers and, and thinking about this um, too cleanly. But it seems to me that, like, if I was choosing between I don't know. Like, obviously, Chris Hogan and Philip Dorsett have higher ceilings, um, way higher ceilings. But in terms of uh, the player most likely to get me 10 points, it's almost certainly Guskowski and Zerline, right? But should kickers, how often should kickers be in GPP lineups, right? We know they should probably be in there in cash. What about GPP lineups? Yeah, that's that's kind of the the caveat here is that in cash game lineups, they do have a little bit of a higher floor than some of these other wide receivers than like a, you know, Chris Hogan or Philip Dorsett or someone like that that can easily go, you know, one for 10 or zero mm-hmm. for 40 or, or something like that. Um, but in terms of in terms of upside, their upside is really capped. I mean, it's really hard to get into even double digits as a kicker like those guys can get. Uh, you know, like Zerline has averaged over 12 this year, but he he has a lot of distance field goals that that aid him as well. Guskowski's under 10 this year. So it's hard to get them into like the 15 to 16, 17 range where there's really the big upside. So a lot of times it might make sense to build lineups that have a max of one kicker. Uh, you need kind of a really unusual lower scoring affair game to have both kickers uh, be in in the winning lineup, or you need to have a really high scoring game, but via field goals where they're mm-hmm. kicking a ton of field goals Uh, to get in there so sometimes it makes sense to limit your selections to a max of one kicker per lineup but that also depends on the depth of the um the skill position players on the respective teams and with these two teams being so tightly concentrated this slate in particular double kicker lineups are going to make a lot more sense than they would in in other slates Uh, also you want to take into account in consideration the kicking environment obviously in the super bowl we have a dome so the kicking environment is really strong but like that chief's uh, Patriots game where you had concerns about cold weather and you had two teams that are pretty aggressive on fourth downs, the kicking upside in that game is really limited. Mm-hmm. So it, it didn't make sense to utilize kickers heavily last week in the New England KC game, but it was more reasonable to do that in the New Orleans Rams game because of the dome environment and the controlled conditions. Uh, I think defenses maybe have a little bit more upside than kicker because they can score touchdowns. It's somewhat rare, but you do get special teams touchdowns. You do get defensive touchdowns do you employ the same strategy with d slash st as you do with kicker so they have a lower floor um Mm -hmm. they do have a higher ceiling in terms of the ability to score touchdowns and you know a defense can put up a 20 plus uh DraftKings point effort and a kicker is almost never going to do that you're going to have a very rare situation for that to happen so um, defenses do have higher upside the challenge in general in showdown slates is defenses tend to get over owned they tend to be owned, you know, 15, 20, 35% of the time. And when we run our optimals, they're, you know, usually coming out like five, 10%. So I rarely play defenses in showdowns, even in games that are projected to be low scoring or potentially turnover prone. Like a lot of games that are projected to be low scoring are two teams that run the ball a lot. And people mistake that for, you know, potential upside in defenses because it's going to be low scoring, but there's not upside in terms of the amount of plays uh, that defenses can really generate big points. So a lot of times defenses are overowned, and that's one of the small edges in showdown this year has been the fact that people are playing defenses far too much uh, for what they should be in showdown. I mean, they really have to score a touchdown mm-hmm. to be in the winning lineup, unless it's just a game where, you know, an onslaught works and the team's like shutting out the other team. Um, if, if both teams score 20 plus points, which happens in tons of NFL games, they really need a defensive touchdown to be in, in, in the winning showdown lineup in GPPs. I have an idea for um, defense and a correlation play. And we're going to get to correlation plays in a minute here. But as you're talking, this one comes to my mind. Uh, Whenever my quarterback that I'm playing uh, in DFS gets pick sixth, I'm like, oh, my God, that's the best thing that could ever possibly happen. What about pairing like Brady with Rams D, which sounds crazy. But if he gets pick sixth, uh, that's really good for Brady. He gets the ball right back. No time went off the clock. Your defense got six and Brady's going to be more aggressive throwing the football. Am I crazy? You're not crazy. Um, Kirk Cousins has done this, I believe, two or three times this year. He's been in the winning lineup in a showdown slate with the opposing defense. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it takes it takes a, a weird combination. So Brady Rams will be low owned. So that's that's the benefit for GPPs. But Brady doesn't turn it over a ton. So it's mm-hmm. like really a, a low probability play. 
a guy like Cousins, who has a history of throwing pick sixes uh, and seemingly does it on all these showdown slates, um, those guys have a little bit more opportunity to do it. Or like a Blake Bortles or something like that, where you knew if Blake Bortles, for him to maximize his upside, he has to be throwing a lot. And the only way he's throwing a lot is if they get way behind early. And so like those types of quarterbacks do make sense and potentially correlating with defenses. In this game, I think Goff and the Patriots would be a little bit stronger than Brady and the Rams just because Goff is a little bit more turnover prone. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is viable in the sense that, you know, both of these teams, if they get behind early, are more likely to heavily lean on the passing game because, you know, both both coaches are pretty smart about not wasting possessions. All right. I want to get to correlations, which I think is the crux of of the argument here for GPPs and showdown. And in conjunction with that, I got to talk about this guy drewby <laughs> all right so for those that don't know and i'm sure a lot of people out there don't know and, and i actually don't know the full story I, I want you to give it but colin uh drew uh i believe was like a, a regular mid stakes dfs player uh drew and the guys at daily roto hired him to be their uh marketing guy for daily roto and this year in showdown <laughs> He's gone on some epic tear where on virtually every showdown slate he's been at or near the top. Uh, is that the right story, Drew? And, 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 what am yeah. I miss, and what am I missing here? Yeah, that's the right story. He's a guy who largely played uh, NHL, uh, PGA, and NFL. And he's you know mid-stakes grinder, really focused on like the three max entry type tournaments. Um, got interested in showdown this year as we were trying to, you know, build out our optimizer and our tools for it and thought, you know, there might be an edge in terms of how I'm going to build correlated lineups compared to the field. And I think he's won like six showdown slates this year, something, something just absurd. Um, and he's, he won one of the really big ones where he just tied with one other person. And the thing about winning showdown slates is it's very difficult to win them solo. You're generally going to tie with, you know, 10 to 70 people somewhere in there so anytime you can win a showdown plate where you only tie with less than 10 like that's a huge huge win Mm -hmm. um but yeah he's had an incredible year uh we've had uh, another one of our subscribers who's written some guest blogs for us uh zandemir who's done he's won a bunch of showdown contests as well kind of employing somewhat similar strategies uh but the whole idea behind what the edge is currently in showdown is trying to correctly correlate your lineup specifically with the captain spot do you regret hiring Drewby and letting him suck all of the showdown money out of the <laughs> ecosystem? I, uh, I, sh- I would say that I do like selfishly for an instant, but then he actually like without him, I don't think I would have figured out all this stuff about how to play showdown correctly. So he's actually uh, been the one teaching me and, and Mike Leone as well, how to like really approach the showdown things. Cause we've been, we're all, all, all our content is focused on, you know, main slate and trying to figure out those correlations and stuff like that. And he had really dug in on this early and kind of figured out that there were some opportunities to take advantage of. Uh, people have told me that uh, I have been successful and been good at marketing. Uh, DFS, not so much. Drewby, the exact opposite, it seems. He's great at DFS <laughs> and the marketing might be meh. Should we switch, should we switch jobs, Drew? Yeah, I, I think I think there's an opportunity there. I, I I guess his whole marketing plan was just win every showdown spread <laughs> and then tweet screenshots and bring people over to Daily Roto, which I mean, you know, that's that's one way to go about it. But yeah, you probably haven't seen our ads on like Facebook or, or Twitter or different things like that. Uh, they're just screenshots of, of Drewby's showdown success. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into this. We're all we're all tracing Jerby with these correlations. Now, I want to talk specifically about this game. We're not going to give the answer to the test. Obviously, we never do that. I am just curious for general correlations. Like, would you ever play Tom Brady with James White? I'm sorry, would you ever not play James White with Tom Brady? Like, if you're using James White, do we have to use Tom Brady? I think so. I think the only scenario that you would consider that is if you were building Rams onslaughts for like a really, really big uh, Rams blowout victory, and then you could have James White solo. Um, But I would say for sure, I would never play James White in the captain spot without Tom Brady. Because for James White to be the winning captain player, Tom Brady is going to have a good game. Like there's no, there's no real path unless James White catches like 15 balls and Tom Brady doesn't throw a touchdown. There's not, there's the the paths there are very thin. So the question is always like twofold. It's would you consider playing this player without this player in general or as a captain? 
and the captain keys and functionality in terms of like how you're setting up your correlations are really important. That's really the differentiator that not, not the entire field is utilizing right now. Uh, it seems to me that a large part of this is like thinking of a game script in your head and then mapping out what it would look like in a showdown lineup. So like, let's say you think the Rams win a close but low scoring game and then build your lineup that way, right? And obviously, if yep. you're mass multi-entering, you could attack many different game scripts, you know, New England low score, New England blowout, New England uh, high scoring close, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are you thinking about those as you're going through uh, building your lineups? 100%. So one of the one of the cool things that we have with our projections at Daily Rota is they're customizable. So you can change the game score that's projected, you can change the number of plays, you can change the run pass distribution, and you can build naturally different sets of lineups based on different game types. Uh, so I will often do this unless I'm super, super confident that one game script is going to play out. I will usually build sets of like, you know, 25 of New England blowout, 25 of Rams blowout, 25 of low scoring competitive, 25 of high scoring shootout um, and kind of work from there. And I think that's one of the big edges in terms of correlating your lineups correctly is recognizing that, you know, the, the prize pools are really top heavy in these showdowns. You're going to tie with a lot of people and to get up to the top, you need to build for a game scenario that might not be expected by the population. So making sure that you have lineups that have, you know, onslaughts where there are five of one team and just one of, of the other team coming back and different things like that uh, make a lot of sense. And so building out and trying to project different individual game scripts is a key part of showdown mass multi-entry strategy. All right. Let me ask you about a couple more of these correlations. Can I ever play Sony Michelle who has one target in his last six games? Can I ever <laughs> play him with Tom Brady? Or is that just egregious? So I made this mistake in the divisional weekend, uh, or I guess uh, the the wild card weekend, where no, the divisional weekend, where the chart, yeah, the Chargers played the Patriots, and the Patriots just went nuts. And I just didn't see a path on like main slate and two game slates and different things like that, where Brady, White, and Sony Michelle all hit. Mm -hmm. And so I had a rule that was max one of Michelle White Burkhead in my lineups uh, when I was running through my optimizer. And that was a rule that I, I shouldn't have kept over for the showdown game. Because what can happen in an individual game is New England just dominates the Chargers. And as a result, uh, Sonny Michelle racks up touchdowns and scoring opportunities while James White does a lot of the work early to kind of get them down the field. And that's what happens. So you can certainly play Sonny Michelle and Tom Brady together. But the, the type of lineup that that is going to work best in is a really high scoring affair for the Patriots in general with a lot of the offense concentrated between Brady, one other receiver, and Sonny Michelle, or a Pats onslaught where it's Brady, two receivers, and Sonny Michelle, and you're just not using very many Rams. You're using like one Rams receiver kind of coming back, hoping they uh, eat up garbage time. So in general, if you were just like jamming projections, you probably wouldn't want a lot of Brady and Michelle paired together. But if you were building lineups for a specific game type, there are specific game types or uh, results and scripts that you'd want those two together. Do you have a take on this girly CJ Anderson thing? Because there, it, it's mixed out there. I mean, everybody assumes that he's hurt, but um, Todd Gurley doesn't say he's hurt. He hasn't been on the injury report. And he's practiced full for like seven straight sessions. Um, it's I find it hard to believe that Todd Gurley was benched in favor of a guy that they signed a few weeks ago. How are you handling Gurley versus CJ Anderson uh, in projections this week? So from a projection standpoint, it's the biggest headache of the week by far. There's nothing else that comes close to it because it impacts a few different things. One, you know, the, the, the obvious is it impacts the workload between those two running backs and trying to figure that out is difficult. But the thing that a lot of people aren't realizing that it also impacts is the more Gurley is on the field, the less target share is available to other wide receivers. The more CJ Anderson is on the field, the more target share that is available to the other receivers. So depending on where you kind of split those two in terms of the running back snaps and the allocation, it also moves the wide receiver projections around quite a bit because CJ Anderson's just basically a zero in the passing game and Todd Gurley's you know, been very successful in that role. And teams generally attack the Patriots with running backs in the passing game. We saw that with Damian Williams last week. We saw earlier in the season when Kansas City played New England that Kareem Hunt had a huge game mm -hmm. out of the backfield catching passes. So 
it's a, it's the most difficult thing of the slate. That is one of the things that I will be customizing different scenarios around, whether Todd Gurley plays a lot or whether he doesn't play as much um, in the game because it, it does have a really, really big impact on things. My overall take on it is that I don't think Todd Gurley's hurt in any way, shape, or form. He ran so effectively against Dallas that I think it's hard to suggest that you know he's hurt um, in, in the practice schedules and not being on the injury report support that. I think ultimately, you know, he had a couple really bad drops early in that game uh, against New Orleans, one that turned into the turnover on the first drive of the game, and then one that um, I, I believe had a chance to extend a drive in the second quarter. And I think they just were like, look, if you're not going to be in there, you know, make, making hay in the passing game, we're just going to we're just going to roll with CJ Anderson. And, you know, he's done well enough for us. I don't know that that's the right tactical move just because they're so much more predictable when CJ Anderson's in the game because they're playing one, one receiver down. Uh, but it worked for them um, going forward. I really don't know. I think it's going to be a hot hand situation in this game where if Todd Gurley starts out well, he could potentially dominate carries and opportunities and snaps. Uh, but if he doesn't, we might see something similar to what we saw the first uh, two playoff games. Yeah. I mean, even in the Dallas game, Gurley looked great and they were still 14, 14 and carries going to the fourth and CJ yeah. ended up out carrying him 23, 16 in a game where Gurley played great. So I, I don't know, man, it's, it's, it's just a weird, weird, weird thing. I, I one correlation I think that does work. I mean, Gurley will for sure, like say the Rams are getting blown out, then it's for sure Gurley. So like yeah. if I was playing five and one, you could make a case for the one to be Gurley, right? Like five Patriots and yeah. one Ram being Gurley. Yeah, I think what you do is you would automatically exclude C.J. Anderson from your player pool in any kind of five, you know, man stacks of New England. Because mm -hmm. um, that game script just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The only way that that hits is if C.J. Anderson is just ru running up and down the field and he's the only guy they're giving the ball to. And that's just so, so unlikely to have happen. Um, all right. You know, never play like two punts at the same position, right? So like Gerald Everett yep. and Tyler Higby at the same position would be a disaster, right? Exactly. And uh, similarly, like you probably wouldn't play Philip Dorsett and Chris Hogan in mm -hmm. the same lineup. Um, it's just very unlikely that those two guys are the guys that are that are going to make hay in, in a Patriots uh, winning lineup. Um, so, yeah, managing those those types of plays. Similarly, like when you had the Chiefs on slates, you probably wouldn't play Demetrius Harris and Travis Kelsey together, um, even though Demetrius Harris might pop up into some lineups because the Chiefs have a concentrated offense and he's really cheap. Um, so yeah, you want to be thoughtful about how, and similarly, like I wouldn't play Sony Michelle and Rex Burkhead in the same lineup. I know they both scored in that game against the chargers, but it's just so unlikely that both of those guys are hitting, uh, that I would, I would try to rule and group that out, uh, using our optimizer. Uh, any other mistakes you see people making, generally speaking with correlation and the captain's spot and all that? I mean, it, there's gotta be just total disaster lineups out there that are mostly drawing dead. Yeah, so if you have like Brandon Cooks in the captain spot, you should have Jared Goff in that lineup. Very yeah. simply, like um, if if you have Jared Goff in the captain slot, he should be paired with at least two receivers because there's not a scenario where he goes off and it's just one receiver that that receiver wasn't a better captain play than Goff. So you need to think about it in that context. Like you want to maximize the overall results of the lineup when you're entering these GPPs. And so while you, you might think, oh, Goff could spread it around or something like that. And that might make sense in like a median projection level. It doesn't make sense if you're putting him in the captain spot to not have him paired with at least two pass catchers. Because most likely for him to be the winning captain, he's going to have to throw three touchdowns. And even if they all went to one guy, that guy should have been the captain. Um, so things like that, that I don't think people are thinking through at all when they're building lineups, um, at least the vast majority of people that are playing these games. All right. I think I think we've said it all. I actually think we've said too much. I mean, this is yeah. Drew, 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 Drew B's ROI. It just is going down by every minute that you talk here. He's not going to be happy uh, with you. So I think we've said enough. I think we've said it all. I will be playing. I'll be in the streets, man. I'm not I don't even know exactly what's right. I'll be out there mashing buttons with everybody. But I think Drew has helped us uh, a lot here. Get ready to play the one game slate if we have never played the one game slate before, as I said, I'm in the streets. Drew, what are you doing for the Super Bowl? Any, anything fun down there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to a friend's uh, Super Bowl party in Miami. I'm playing golf on Saturday, you know, smelling the roses uh, wow. for, for Super Bowl weekend. So now that, now that you know, we're back down to basically one sports season, uh, I have a life again, and that's great news for me. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to a Super Bowl party, and I will be in the streets as well in Showdown. I had my head-to-heads posted as soon as the conference championship <laughs> games uh, were done. I'm very much looking forward to this, this last week of the NFL. All right, where can the people find you? Drew, give them the Twitter, give them, the, give them, give them everything. 
Yeah, you can find me at Drew Dinkmeyer on Twitter. You can find uh, all of my content over at uh, Daily Roto. We've got you know premium projections, content, Slack chat, uh, optimizer tools to help you. Uh, we we specifically try to break down all these showdown slates with all the types of groups and rules that we're using in our in our optimizers to kind of help build smarter lineups. And there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of good uh, intelligent people who've done really well in showdown this year. So if you need help, uh, check us out for the Super Bowl. All right, that is gonna do it for Jerry, for Drew, for Drewby, for <laughs> producer Luke. I am Adam. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Good luck. We are promoters at DraftKings and also avid fans. Our usernames are Adam Levitan, Al Smizzle, and CSU Ram 88 We may sometimes play on our personal accounts in the games that we offer advice on. Although we have expressed our personal view on the games and strategies in this podcast, they do not necessarily reflect the views of DraftKings, and we also may deploy different players and strategies than what we recommended in this podcast.